the modern enterprise will be built on data powered by AI, put to work through a new generation of applications. Everything we've done for 10 years, but now as AI has become so prominent in range of business problems, a uh, super productive area you know, for, for our focus. When I joined Excel, it was really quite small. We had pretty high aspirations. We went through a journey there, um, scaling the firm, diversified the firm in terms of sectors we were investing in. Actually, we're quite successful. Very hard to predict consumer behavior, and, and you would be much more successful if you waited for evidence of adoption. If you remember back in 2012, a lot of people thought relational database technology was dead. Hadoop was the big thing. Remember Hadoop? When ChatGPT came out, that drove a lot of general interest in using large language models, really tipped the market. Welcome to the Smart Venture Podcast. We're here to bring you the latest and greatest from the Silicon Valley, where unicorns roam and innovation never sleeps. We've got top investors, superstar founders, and well-known tech executives lined up to share their secrets on building and investing in successful companies. Just a quick disclaimer, while we may sound like financial geniuses, but please don't mistake us for your friendly neighborhood financial advisors. So let's get started and dive into the wild world of tech entrepreneurship. Our sponsor, Alumni Ventures, offers individual investors access to venture investing through its diversified, professional-grade venture portfolios. The company's funds have consistently outperformed public market equivalents with over $1.1 billion raised and invested in over 1,100 portfolio companies. They have a dedicated team of 50 full-time venture investors and were the number one most active venture firm in the U.S. in 2022. And Number three, globally at crowding to pitch bug. Investing in venture capital can help reduce the overall portfolio risk and increase the likelihood of stronger returns. To learn more, visit av.vc slash grace. That's av.vc slash grace and schedule a call. Investors must be accredited. Please note that all financial investments involve risk. Past performance does not guarantee future results. And it is important to conduct your own research and seek professional advice before making any investment decisions. Now, please enjoy the show. Hi, Peter. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Yeah, thanks for having me. To start the show, I would love for the audience to get to know you a little bit because um, on the internet, you are a little bit mysterious. And uh, so you've worked at Excel for 15 years before starting Wing Venture Capital with your partner who worked at Sequoia for over 10 years. And you joined Excel as a young associate when the firm was like a small firm. And then when you left, it became like a global leader. So before that, you work at McKinsey and Silicon Graphics. To start the show, I would love for you to kind of share with us how what kind of work experience or like life experience kind of shape you into who you are today? I studied physics uh, originally and was uh, interested in, and I grew up on the East Coast. And so I really didn't know much about Silicon Valley <laughs> or and uh, my idea of, uh, of technology was more, you know, aerospace and research and, mm -hmm. and things like that. And um, I kind of figured out through some research jobs while I was an undergraduate that kind of the white lab coat thing wasn't wasn't really for me, <laughs> and, but I didn't know what was. So, so I ended up going to McKinsey as kind of a very general um, sort of first experience uh, in business and, and enjoyed that and, and went to business school. Mm -hmm. And it was really there that I decided I wanted to work uh, in high growth technology businesses. And so kind of get back to some of that early scientific uh, training, but combine it uh, with the whole notion of, of building a business around it and specifically you know, the entrepreneur, the entrepreneurial aspect of that. And I had to work pretty hard to convince anyone to give me uh, a chance in Silicon Valley. You know, I was this kind of random, random guy with very generic experience <laughs> from the East Coast. And so I sent out a million, a million resumes trying to get a summer internship, uh, got turned down by almost everybody, um, was, uh, you know, over, you know, like uh, margaritas in a Mexican restaurant was able to convince like one of my classmates fraternity brothers to, you know, to give me a chance. And that's how I became um, a, a summer intern at Silicon Graphics. Uh, and that was in, uh, in 1991. And that was just a fantastic experience. Uh, a, a wonderful group of people that went on to just do incredible things. One of the great alumni groups uh, in Silicon Valley and just many tremendous founders and venture capitalists and industry leaders, you know, came 
out of that company at that time. And so, so that's how uh, I ended up leaving the East Coast, moving to California <laughs> and uh, became a product manager in 3D graphics workstations. And this was all, you know, before the internet. So uh, that, that was, uh, you know, some of the stuff we were working on back in those days. Awesome. For our Gen, Gen Z audience, so Silicon Graphics was kind of like the Google of its day, if like I understand it correctly. So basically, it's like a really um, popular company to join back then. Um, to like, so you're quite successful today. Who do you consider as your personal board of advisors when it comes to you know having a great career in venture? Yeah, I you know I've I learned uh, so much from. Um, the partners uh, of Excel, you know, that were there ahead of me. And, you know, I joined Excel after after four years at SGI. You know, while I was at, at Silicon Graphics, the internet happened. Um, a lot of things changed. Actually, our founder, uh, Jim Clark, uh, left the company to start Netscape with Mark Andreessen, you know, and, and that happened while I was there. And, and a lot of our people ended up going there. Uh, and, and so that just cracked open this sort of real uh, tidal wave of of startup opportunity that that a lot of us got very excited about, and and that led me, you know, initially investigating startup opportunities, but then um, also intersected some venture firms uh, in the process of of looking at some of the startups that that they were looking at or that they had invested in, and so that that's how I ended up joining Excel. Uh, and you know, the founders of Excel, Jim Swartz uh, and Arthur Patterson. Um, uh, were just tremendous uh, humans, tremendous teachers, and I, I really uh, learned a ton, uh, and and still do. Uh, you know, lean on their on their insight, uh, and they've just been great, great resources, great great friends, and great mentors. And you know, also just as a, a young venture person, you know, when I when I joined um, Excel in 1996, I, you know, I had <laughs> didn't really have much to offer, uh, but there were uh, I was fortunate enough to. Uh, have some of my very early deals uh, be, uh, you know, co-invested with some great venture investors uh, who, you know, I served on boards alongside. And so, you know, those people also became uh, just tr excellent sounding boards and, and teachers and examples. And so those were people like uh, Andy Ratcliffe, who uh, I'm still very close with and um, is, you know, an investor and advisor at Wing. And, and we were on the board of a company called North Point Communications, which was probably my second deal. You know, he's one of the founders of Benchmark. Um, Roger Evans, who was just a, a great uh, venture capitalist from Greylock back in that time, was on that same board. Uh, I was unfortunate to be on uh, maybe my very first board with a with Doug Leone from Sequoia. So, you know, so just a lot of a lot of great resources and people to learn from. And uh, I'm not I'm not sure that that happens as much today. You know, back then we you know we the venture firms co invested alongside each other um, more frequently uh, and collaborated. I think more generously. Um, it was also just a smaller industry. So even kind of a young know nothing like myself could end up, <laughs> you know, working with some of those legends that I just mentioned. Uh, so that was, that was pretty fortunate. Well, I think you're very humble. And so like, I'm also curious, like, after Excel, you started your own fund. And like, what were something that you took away from like your experiences there and like also, you know, as among like all these amazing people in your network, like what are some things that you've learned that you applied into your own fund? Well, you know, I mean, when I joined Excel, it was really quite small, um, smaller than Wing is today, uh, you know, but we had pretty high aspirations, uh, but, um, you know, it was just a, a, a small number of, of partners uh, and, the, you know, fund sizes were smaller back then. And, and we were really just, Cracking into, uh, I'd say, you know, the elite, uh, the elite venture firms. We hadn't fully established that yet, although that uh, made good progress on that. Uh, and uh, we went through a journey there where we really started um, scaling the firm um, in terms of people, in terms of assets under management. We also uh, diversified the firm in terms of geographies, in terms of sectors we were investing in. Um, also in terms of stage by, you know, adding uh, a whole team dedicated to growth equity investing. And, and these initiatives actually were quite successful. Uh, and uh, so I learned a lot by helping to lead that. I, be, I became one of the managing partners at one point. And, and uh, we, you know, really together with Sequoia and uh, were kind of leading that whole evolution of venture. There were some 
things that you know happened that maybe we didn't intend and 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 one was just that you know as you start doing all these things you know you lose focus uh and and it is um challenging to be 100 percent laser focused on everything you know so there's a trade-off there and so uh, i found that the early stage uh practice especially uh focused on uh, b2b technology was um, suffering a bit uh, as more and more emphasis was placed on consumer investing, on growth investing, on the international initiatives and teams that we're building. And, and uh, so that was really part of the genesis for where Wing came from was, was that observation. And Gara at Sequoia, by the way, was having, my co-founder was having um, similar observations. And we thought that there would be some benefits to uh, a firm that was 100% focused on early stage investing, with a long-term company building approach in B2B technology. And if you just, you were a pure play, that's all you were doing that you could do it really well. You could put more resources uh, on the field, uh, even than a, you know, a big multi-stage firm might, might be able to do. And, you know, so you could uh, become best of breed in that domain. Uh, and, and that was the theory. <laughs> and so that, so that's what we've been working on these past 10 years at wing. And, uh, you know, this, I think been been some good results. There's still a lot left to do, uh, but mm. it's it's been a good a good journey so far. So wing like I'm curious like back in time you were doing both like consumer and B2B. Like why did you feel like so like you mentioned there's like a gap that like you know B2B was not getting a lot of love or in a way that's like something is missing. So I'm curious like what were the things that you thought was missing and then. When you started Wing, what were some kind of like concept that you felt like you guys adopted better than everybody else in the industry? Yeah, yeah. So, well, so that that whole focus thing actually was like an, an Excel core principle when I joined, <laughs> uh, and and then we kind of moved away from it. You know, so in some ways, it was it was taking that that idea of ruthless focus uh, and reasserting it. Uh, but you know, the reason that we thought that B two B early stage investing um, was kind of the fish out of water in the diversified model was because it's 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 a different methodology than anything else that was going on in the firm. And and let me let me explain that. So, what one thing when when we first Excel used to do no consumer investing, by the way, and then and then um, after the dot com bust when the smoke cleared in like two thousand three two thousand four. Uh, you know, we consciously got back into that and several of my partners led that and, and did, did a great job on it. Initially, we were pursuing the same approach that we had pursued in B2B, which was okay, you know, two founders and an idea, you know, ground zero investing, true startup early stage investing, which is what we'd always done. And it turned out that didn't work very well in consumer. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, it was very hard to predict consumer behavior and, and you would be much mm -hmm. more successful if you waited for evidence of adoption. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of my colleagues, uh, Kevin Effersey, mm -hmm. at that time was very clear about this. And, and he, you know, sort of get us, uh, got the whole um, firm focused on, you know, the inflection point where you see usage mm -hmm. rising, uh, mm -hmm. but it's not totally obvious to, to the world and, and really waiting mm -hmm. for that evidence. And, and um, you know, I think within a year, the whole industry <laughs> had jumped on, mm -hmm. had jumped on that observation. But, uh, you know, so and that became how consumer investing was done was to wait for mm -hmm. evidence of adoption, don't try and predict consumer behavior. Mm -hmm. um, but in, in with businesses, actually, you can predict their behavior. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, they're, they tend uh, to, um, if, you, if you really understand the users and the, and, the, and the processes and the organizations and their goals, um, it is possible uh, to mm -hmm without evidence of adoption, um, you sort of have a, a decent sense uh, of whether there will be product market fit, whether there will be adoption. So you don't, you really shouldn't wait, you know, you, you need to get in. And there's also a lot of sort of foundation building that needs to happen that won't happen by itself. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, that's the difference in the methodology is you're investing before evidence of adoption and you're leaning into building that foundation you know, with some resources, you know, when it still might seem somewhat speculative in, in terms of, you know, any objective evidence. And mm -hmm. so, so we tried to build Wing to be really good at that uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and and only focus on that. And it's it's hard to do that in concert with a growth investing team or a consumer team because they're trained to invest on the basis of data, right? Mm -hmm. They want to see growth rates. They want to see renewal rates. They want to see, uh, you know, net revenue retention. You know, there's a lot, a lot of metrics that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the whole, the whole industry has jumped on. Uh, when you're doing early stage B2B, there's no metrics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, know, you, have to, you have to, you have to use different types of analysis. Um, so. 
what are something that you use to exam these deals for the audience like i just want to give like the audience some kind of like context on how wing have performed so like wing has invested in 23 enterprise technology companies that have gone public or achieved billion dollar outcomes and recently wing 4 has just raised like 600 million dollars on like you know focusing on ai related investing so i would love for you to share like you know some of your famous portfolio are like you know snowflake and gone like these are really top deals in like enter enterprise technology in this like whole sector and um so you kind of spotted these companies before everybody else. So I'm curious, like, how, what are some benchmarks that you personally use to um, find deals like this? And how do you evaluate it without like a lot of data at the beginning? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, again, this is one of the big takeaways from <laughs> Jim Swartz and Arthur Patterson and Excel, you know, that they used to talk about this thing called the prepared mind, which, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we still talk about here. And mm -hmm. I'm sure the Excel people still talk about a lot as well. And it, it's, built off a quote uh, from Louis Pasteur, you know, the great French scientist that says chance uh, favors the prepared mind. And, and what that really means, uh, you know, what that phrase is meant to mean is that you um, identify uh, an area which you think uh, there's something really interesting going on, <laughs> you know, some, some disruption that is going to create outsized opportunity. And you just go to school on that. You focus on that. You, you become, you know, and not just one person, but like you're the whole team becomes world's leading authority on what matters in that area. What, uh, you know, the leading companies are that are, are likely to be bumping into this emerging set of opportunities. Who are the, the potential founders that, you know, their backgrounds read on, you know, this space in a, in a particularly relevant way. And then by focusing and seeking out those individuals and those companies, you're, you know, when, when you engage uh, with those opportunities, you're more likely to recognize uh, what's interesting, you're more likely to resonate with the team. Uh, they will recognize you, you know, as a valuable partner because you get it and, and maybe you're contributing to that conversation uh, in a more thoughtful or uh, or constructive way than, you know, people that haven't um, sort of developed this, le this level of depth in it. Uh, and so you can sort of push ahead in that identified area, um, hopefully make some of the seminal investments that go on to become uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, the defining companies, uh, you know, not just of a category, but of a whole movement, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, so that, uh, you know, that's that's sort of core to our practice. So we're always, you know, within our universe, we're always pushing mm -hmm. on, you know, several of these themes where, you know, we're, where we're trying to uh, mount a, you know, prepared mind initiative. Uh, and if you choose wisely, I mean, you might choose a dry hole and then it sucks. <laughs> you know, the, the mm -hmm. thing that you thought was going to be interesting turns mm -hmm. out not to be. And so then you have to abandon ship, you know, redeploy resources somewhere else. But, you know, but if you choose wisely, you know, you you are more likely, you know, than not uh, to, you know, be, you know, in the best position and recognized as the best partner for a really interesting raft of opportunities that will be emerging. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so we, so we, you know, we continue to do that, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. right now, obviously, uh, you know, our, our whole focus from the beginning has been around how, uh, you know, the modern enterprise will be built on data powered by AI. You know, this, the, these uh, mm -hmm. insights are going to be put to work through a new generation of applications that you know mm -hmm. lean on lean on those uh, lower layers of the stack in a, in a really in a really true way. Uh, and um, you know that that is is kind of been driving um, a lot of what we've done for you know everything we've done for ten years. But now, mm -hmm. as AI has become so prominent and so so usable. Uh, you know, not just theoretical, but actually practical for an, mm -hmm. an increasing range of business problems. Um, you know, this has become a uh, super productive area, you know, for, for our focus. And, and this includes, you know, deep infrastructure work, the, you know, the data layers that support mm -hmm. AI, uh, a lot mm -hmm. of the, a lot of the tooling that developers use to build um, AI native applications. And then of course, those applications themselves, uh, you mentioned mm -hmm. Gong, that would, that would actually be a good example. You know, Gong mm -hmm. started in 2016, <laughs> you know, you don't way before chat GPT, but you know, it mm -hmm. is, it is in fact, uh, uh, an AI powered application and, you know, the range of AI that is available to them has increased quite a bit and they've replatformed the application to take advantage of it. But that, you know, that was uh, an early example, one that really has helped drive a lot of our thinking, uh, in terms of what, you know, what, what Amit Bendoff, the founder of Gong, would call an autonomous application, or you might think of it as an AI powered application. Um, you know, he, he really has uh, kind of opened, I know, opened my eyes to a lot of what matters there, a lot of what works. Okay, so I want to just like, there's like two layers of my question. One layer is like from the building, like a good portfolio site, and then the other 
set of questions about like you know finding the best company i guess like they're the same question but like okay so um let's use one of your portfolio like pinecone as example right like so pinecone like for the non-technical people so i have took some notes on like what it is okay so pinecone was basically like involved in the domain of like a vector vector database which assists in managing and searching high dimensional data in the realm of machine learning so basically it's like in the world of ai there's a kind of data called vectors that challenging that's like challenging to handle with the traditional tools and like so pinecone makes it easier for businesses to work with this type of data almost like kind of like a specialized search engine for specific ai tasks i don't know if my explanation is correct but this is like what from whatever i've been reading and then like this is the best i could sum up with and if i'm wrong please peter like say whatever you think it is and so um basically like so it's really hard like for i guess like when you're investing a company like this um you mentioned that you guys are really focused and then you want to be a domain expert first and like what are your way to kind of study the industry and then how did you encounter this company to make you feel like oh okay so i'm gonna pull the trigger to invest in them i believe you did the seed investment and then uh you know on your blog you call pinecone the ai of snowflake or snowflake of ai so um can you explain to us like just walk us through like how you find this deal and then like what did you find in the sector that make you believe this is something that would um, you know, make sense to invest since there's so many AI applications. Like literally, every company is an AI company now. Especially the NFT company, everybody transition into AI now. So I'm curious, <laughs> how do you uh, separate like a good company uh, among like the crowded AI market nowadays? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, well, Pinecone. I mean, it. You know, it it, it comes directly out of uh, you know a, a, a thematic investment initiative that we've been pursuing around cloud data platforms. Mm -hmm. uh, Snowflake you know, was a terrific, you know, sort of early mm -hmm. example of that for us, mm -hmm. uh, where we, you know, invested in this, in the seed financing in early mm -hmm. 2013 and every financing the company's ever done since. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, feel really blessed to have been able to work with that team and, and continue to work with them. Um, they're all uh, good friends and, and good partners. Um, you know, Snowflake uh, used the power of the cloud to reinvent an existing practice called data warehousing. Uh, and, and that, in ended up being incredibly powerful. Uh, if you remember back in 2012, um, you know, people, a lot of people thought relational database technology was dead. You know, Hadoop was the big thing. Remember Hadoop, <laughs> right? I mean, and, you know, there were, I mean, I was also, you know, close with the Cloud Era team and have a lot of respect for them, but that that particular prediction that, that relational had run its course obviously turned out to be very wrong and and you you could reinvent it and and uh, and, and create incredible value. And that's, that's what the Snowflake guys did. Um, you know, the, the whole notion of uh, when, when the question of like, when is a new data platform needed mm -hmm. and possible is, is a really interesting one, right? I mean, you know, so mm -hmm. Snowflake went after existing workloads with a better platform mm -hmm. and, and that worked incredibly well. And, and they were able to insert into uh, a, a, an ecosystem of tools and, you know, DBAs and, you know, people that were trained up on, on SQL and all of that just plugged beautifully into uh, the Snowflake platform. It's a little different when you're talking about new workloads and new data types. And, and so sometimes if, the, if, if there's a new generation of workloads that's going to be important enough, and if its requirements in terms of data types and processing is different enough, right, that can motivate a new data platform. And that's the pinecone theory, right? Yeah, that that is a, it, precisely what led us to pinecone. So we thought, mm -hmm. okay, there's this new generation of AI-centric workloads emerging, um, and they work with really different data. They do not work with rows and columns. They they do not work with tables. They work with vectors and mm -hmm. and you know things that data scientists call embeddings. And you know when I first started on this, I didn't know what an embedding was, but you know being a physicist, I do know what a vector is. And so <laughs> eventually got you know figured that out and and was was fortunate enough to be introduced by one of uh, another entrepreneur that I had backed previously to a neighbor of his to uh, he introduced me to this guy named Edo Liberty uh, who was still working at Amazon Web Services and was one of the people that stood up their SageMaker um, product line and I just got in this dialogue with Edo where he you know he 
clearly understood things that nobody else did, you know, because he had had to build this rather, in, you know, complicated system and build it for scale inside Amazon that was supporting machine learning. And, you know, Ito is both a, an ML researcher and, you know, a person with a lot of uh, a lot of experience standing up, you know, um, workloads in production. And, you know, he he saw this opportunity uh, to build, you know, a data platform to support this ML stuff. And uh, eventually, you know, I got past, I was sort of dense for a while, it took me a while to figure it out, but that uh, eventually understood enough of what he was talking about to where we led the, the seed round there in 2020, which, you know, mm -hmm. but it was like a, a f over a year mm -hmm. <laughs> of, of talking to Ito before, before we finally did that. But, mm -hmm. uh, but that, you know, that's really a good example because it, it, it captures what, you know, what we're talking about. Like what is, what is the next super cycle in technology? And our, our strong belief is it's AI. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and this is B two B technology I'm talking about, and and once you know you come to that conclusion, you can you can say okay, what has to change here? What has to change mm -hmm. the data layer? What has to change? You know what is possible with applications? What has to change in the middle uh, in order to deal with vectors? In order to deal with you know uh, AI processing and and, and mm -hmm. uh, you know and, and everything from sort of the raw data itself to how that needs to be prepared and flowed through systems. Uh, to uh, you know what uh, what what developer tooling is required so that people can build with it and, and it it is there's a whole new stack right you know and so that's one one way that we think about it is this AI first technology stack is sort of you know the big new thing we're going to work on for the next ten years uh, and and Pinecone is 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 the foundation of that. Okay, so I have two questions there. So basically, based on what you just said, like how you kind of find these deals are. Um, essentially, like, let's say you were thinking about, like, what would be, like, the newer version of Snowflake, like, what kind of fundamental change that has happened in this new generation of new tools, and you kind of, like, research, okay, so here's, like, five, let's say, category that it needs to change, and then you find, let, let's say, like, who are building this category, and, like, I'm curious, like, let's say you maybe you research, like, the vector um, sector is like a sector that's like um, something that you want to focus on and then like how do you you mentioned like you encounter this person's neighbor like I actually went to a talk um, Edo D did like a million years ago like when he first left Amazon but like I don't quite remember what's exactly there but I definitely feel like he was very charismatic um, and then like so I'm curious like how do you Within this sector, how do you find who is going to be the category king? Or like your philosophy would be like, you know, let's invest in uh, all these like very similar deals that's in this sector to, you know, whoever win, like you will win. Yeah. It's like yeah. win. Well, we're not doing that. I mean, you know, so we're, you know, we're, we're not a spray and pray investment strategy. So, mm -hmm. we, you know, we, we, you know, are very intentional in terms of where, where we're making commitments and we put a lot of resources behind each and every one. Right. So, mm -hmm. so it is, you know, okay, we, we may decide that a, a particular area is going to be important. We're looking, we're developing a point of view as to what matters there. And, and then we're looking for people and, and maybe even very young companies that are, are, are developing that territory. Uh, you know, it is, you know, now, now you're into the tough business of, <laughs> of deciding which ones uh, to, to commit to. And, you know, it's a real mistake to fall into this trap of we need a play, right? Like, oh, this area is hot. We need a play. Let's go find a company in there. It's like, well, okay, sure. But, you know, what What about the rest? <laughs> Can we build an important company uh, around this? Uh, and, and so that's where a lot of that has to do with the founder. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it is that, you know, founder market fit is a concept that, you know, people talk about and just the intangible attributes of of, of the founder. You know, are they uh, are they going to be able to attract a great team? Are they going to be able to win early customers? Are they going to be able to uh, attract uh, capital? You know, you know, a lot of what founders have to do, even very technical founders, is selling. Mm -hmm. uh, it's different types of selling, uh, you know, but it, and but that that type of founder salesmanship is a, a really core attribute. You know, which is, you know, as important as product insight or, you know, some of the other things you might be looking for, especially in a very technical product. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, working with those types of people, identifying those types of people is, um, you know, they're rare. <laughs> you know, so fortunately, we don't have to invest in a million companies every year. We can be very mm -hmm. focused. And then, but when, you know, when we find that kind of that kind of opportunity with that type of team, um, we're going to be all in. Got it. So a technical founder that can sell basically is what you're looking for. Um, usually, what, 
you know, and then hopefully, hopefully complemented, right? So it might not just be like one technical founder, but, you know, maybe two that complement each other in different ways, or maybe a product mm -hmm. person and a technologist. That's a, that's a fabulous combination. Um, okay. So what, like, how, how are you examining, like, if their product is going to work? Because I feel like <laughs> the good side of like a being finding the technical person who can sell is they are strong at selling. But the bad side is like they're strong at selling. They can sell without like any kind of like proven record of what they can do, right? So like, how do you, um, I guess, like exam their technical ability or like yeah. being able to like, you know, put together the product that, that can actually work? Yeah. That's, you know, that's actually kind of the easiest thing to evaluate, uh, you know, because, you know, for an engineer or a technologist, um, you know, you, you can evaluate their body of work, where they're coming from, what have they done before, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's a research background or a product building background, um, you know, you can talk to people they've worked with, you can understand, you know, their success mm -hmm. in building teams previously, what are the products they've shipped, <laughs> are those any good, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so even, even if there's nothing built yet, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I think we can generally have pretty high confidence in the ability, the team's ability to deliver, uh, you know, from a, from a, from a product development point of view, um, that, that is easier to assess. The thing that is hardest to assess Mm -hmm. uh, in, in the pre-product phase, remember that, you know, we're, we're, we're investing before evidence of adoption, right? And so mm -hmm. the hardest thing to assess is, are you going to have product market fit? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's also the, the most important thing to assess. So a lot rides on mm -hmm. product market fit. So, so we've done a lot at Wing uh, to help us assess product market fit when you don't have a product. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, this our, our customer network is super relevant here, for example. So we're able mm -hmm. to uh, get very high quality feedback uh, very early in the process, you know, to both identify the potential for product market fit, but also shape it, uh, mm -hmm. you know, help, help the companies get, you know, the right inputs from the right mm -hmm. people when they, when, when they can still take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. um, also, you know, just working consistently in, in a, a small set of domains really helps, you know, because we have a lot of muscle memory around mm -hmm. data infrastructure, around cybersecurity, around AI powered mm -hmm. applications, around, developer tooling, you know, there's, there's a lot of, it's not like it's the first time that we've gone down these roads. So that, mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, gives us uh, a lot more relevant experience, relevant network mm -hmm. that we can call on to help assess this. Um, but it's the biggest risk. It's the biggest risk. You know, you, if you get product market fit wrong, mm -hmm. nothing else matters. <laughs> you know, so, mm -hmm. so you better get that right. <laughs> so when Pinecone first started, like, um, how did they get to product market fit? Like, so did they just like start at the beginning, everything just smoothly happening or like, how do you or like your team that kind of like help them to, um, you know, have a successful product, eventually, yeah. you know, go to market strategy and everything. Right. Well, you know, so for what, you know, the what to build at, at, at Pinecone is really driven by Edo, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, a lot of what he was um, leaning on was his own experience um, building SageMaker you know, as part of the SageMaker team. And so that gave him a lot of insight. These are the challenges that my team had to overcome to stand up this suite of services. I think it's pretty general, you know, mm -hmm. and so here's something we can build that uh, should should meet a pretty broad set of needs. Um, that's great, you know, that, I mean, that that's a tremendous starting point. You know, then you need to sort of evolve that by talking to the right customers or the right mm -hmm. potential customers. And, mm -hmm. and so uh, that, you know, it was frankly kind of hard in like 2020, mm -hmm. 2021, you know, the, I mean, there was a relatively small number of people doing AI in production <laughs> that understood, um, you know, what, what their needs were likely to be, uh, you know, at scale, uh, you know, with economics that makes sense, you know, what, what, the, what the whole product shape needed to be. Uh, mm -hmm. But, um, you know, Ido engaged with, with some, some good ones. We were able to introduce a few who, mm -hmm. you know, who are customers today and, and very happy. Uh, and this was all pre chat GPT, right? Mm -hmm. And now, of course, mm -hmm. when chat GPT came out, that drove a lot of uh, general interest in uh, mm -hmm. using large language models and, and all mm -hmm. the all the range of problems that could be addressed there. So that that really tipped the market and, and drove mm -hmm. a, a surge in demand uh, for uh, for Pinecone. Uh, mm -hmm. Because they were, you know, the ideal back end uh, for people that were mm -hmm. building uh, applications leveraging large language models, and they still are, right? And so mm -hmm. all that building that we had done uh, for several years, uh, you know, left put the company in in a, in a wonderful position to mm -hmm. 
um, support all these developers that were, that were now trying to build stuff using LLMs and needed needed a back end and needed one that was defined the right way and, and performed and scaled and had economics that were viable. You know, uh, so uh, all, all these good things that um, really, really, you know, it, it takes a long time to develop a, a data platform. You don't wake up and, you know, sort of like, three three guys in a dorm room and you know pop out a database like in, in, in a couple of months that's not that's not how it goes i mean you know having worked on snowflake and other data platforms it's like you gotta have some healthy respect uh for what it means to build a data layer that you know can really that that businesses can count on uh and that you know developers can can lean on and and, mm. uh, and have it drive them forward and not become a boat anchor so okay so i have like two more questions around this part so like one thing is like because of you recently just raised like a six hundred million dollar fund. So the the way that you are approaching like this entire sector. By the way, I saw a lot of people asking questions. We're gonna address them at the end. When you have six million six hundred million dollar pool of capital, like it's like really different when you're thinking about like investing what kind of businesses. Like and then like you know you invest in a B two B SaaS company that's like in the seat round to eventually like you can wait until the IPO you know like but like as a young angel investor you know we don't have five billion dollar in the bank right now so like what kind of um company in this enterprise ecosystem especially in you know the AI space we should you know look into and number two is like as someone renting this like 600 million dollar fund like what are some like thinking philosophy? Like, what are some other things that excites you? Like, you know, Pinecone was happening in like, you know, 2020 you, when you invest in them. And like nowadays, like, what do you see as like the seed version of that? Okay. I mean, well, a lot of questions in there. So uh, the, um, <laughs> we're, we're, we're big believers that like strategy should mm-hmm. dictate capital and not vice versa. So one of the dumbest things you can do as a venture person is go out and raise a bunch of money uh, mm-hmm. and then try and cook up a strategy <laughs> that allows you to invest it. You know, that's what we might call an, an AUM driven or assets under management driven mm-hmm. model. Anyone that talks to you about like how much capital they deploy per year, you know, that they are on an AUM model. Don't give them your money. <laughs> right? mm-hmm. they're, they're just there to raise money, invest it, raise more money, invest it. If there's any returns, that's optional. You know, as an investor, you don't want to be part of that. I'm a bigger investor in Wing. All of us are. Uh, we don't want to be part of that. So the, mm-hmm. the, the, the more <laughs> the more sane way to do this is you have a strategy. In our case, it's this early stage investing, long term company building in B2B. Um, you understand the types of companies you're trying to get involved in and when the role you want to play. And then that, you know, there, there's fairly simple mm-hmm. arithmetic that will then um, show what what's an appropriate capitalization for the fund. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, it's based on team size and, you know, the types of, uh, of work that you do. And so we've always been really careful to size the wing funds uh, around our strategy. So the first, the first fund, you know, was quite small. It was $160 million. That's because it was just Garov and I at that time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, now it's, now it's 600. This is a reflection of a bigger team. We have seven investors. Also, mm-hmm some rising capital intensity, even in what we do in early stage uh, is, uh, you know, there's, there's been a, a fairly notable um, increase in terms of, you know, the, the checks being written in early stage companies uh, over the 10 years that, that Wings existed. And so that's how we get to 600 million. I mean, we always, we turn away a lot of money in all of our fundraisings. Um, you know, frankly, it would be easier for us to raise bigger funds Mm-hmm. Um, because we could just say yes to a lot of people that are high quality investors that would be fun to work with. And, you know, but we, we go through the hard exercise of, uh, you know, of, of sort of <laughs> capping things where we think they need to be capped. And I, I think that in the long run, that um, serves us well. You know, you know venture is kind of a, a funny business. Uh, you know, what, we invest in these technology companies where growth is the goal, you know, getting mm-hmm. bigger is the goal. Mm-hmm. That is not true necessarily for a venture firm. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, bigger sometimes leads to worse returns. Well, mm-hmm. not sometimes, often uh, leads mm-hmm. to worse returns. And, and so we're, you know, we're trying to deliver great returns for investors and build, help founders build spectacular companies. And that, that means we can't, uh, you know, so go and, and, and over, oversize the funds. Um, you know, we, we do play the role of a lead investor, so we can't be too small. Uh, you know, because you're just sort of you're not able to provide the level of support that you need to build a company that matters. But mm-hmm. you can't be too big, too, because you, you then you get pulled into later stage investing or trying to jam capital into companies that don't need it. And mm-hmm. all the unhealthy practices that we, we saw over the past several years that are leading to much 
heartbreak mm-hmm. and gnashing of teeth around the industry right now. Mm. Okay, so two questions there. So, like, when you first raised like fund one compared to raising fund four, like, what were the similarity and differences? And like, what was your pitch back then? What's like your pitch now? Since like you know, within ten years, like you know, of course, we see you know companies that's like like Snowflake went really am- amazing and like, but like you know, I guess like, but the rest of the company, like, not every company, especially maybe during let's say like within this ten years, let's say like the the company that you invested in like last year or something, you cannot really showcase a track record. Like, what was a pitch like? You know, now like, how do you kind of like convince the LPs to keep like investing in your fund as well as like you know as of like you know nowadays like you know when you were in、um, Excel like back in time like you know not a lot of people in the industry but nowadays like you know every person with like a Twitter account can raise like you know become a solo GP or something so、um, since like the venture ecosystem have been changing like how do you kind of like emphasize on your personal like or like company wise like unfair advantage to kind of like Uh, use it as your strengths to attract the best deal. For us, I mean, our, our our story is essentially the same as it was in the beginning. You know, there are some details that have changed, but you know, it's always been early stage investing, long term company building in、mm-hmm. you know select sectors in B two B technology that we、mm-hmm. believe strongly in.、Um, initially, we were articulating that as、uh, you know what we call the DMC shift in business technology.、Mm-hmm. So, you know, the 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 simultaneous rise of the data revolution, mobility, and the cloud constituted.、Mm-hmm. You know, a, a new paradigm for for how businesses would use technology,、mm-hmm. and that ended up being really true,、uh, and that drove what's been referred to as digital transformation, which has kind of been the big story in, in B two B technology for、mm-hmm. the last fifteen years. And along the way,、uh, you know, it turns out that that data vector,、uh, sort of propelled by cloud computing resources, became kind of the dominant story. Uh, and it and it it set the table for AI to be applied in the business、mm-hmm. context for the first time, and that has become widespread enough, <laughs> and the technology powerful enough that now you know this isn't just part of the DMC story; it's a new story, right? So this is、mm-hmm. the next super cycle, the next S curve、mm-hmm. in technology, and that'll be the next fifteen years. And why do I say fifteen years? I don't know. It, that's kind of the way it's been. <laughs> I mean, the super cycles just if you just look back, they tend to be fifteen、mm-hmm. years. I, I don't know why,、um, but. Uh, and but this one, you know, this seems really as big as anything that I've seen in my career since、uh, since the original commercialization of the internet,、uh, which was、uh, obviously a, a really powerful super cycle.、Um, and、uh, and so, you know that that、uh, you know that wave is is front and center, obviously, and what we were articulating in the Wing Four fundraising. That's how that capital, you know, that's the the investment thesis, the overarching observation that drives all of our specific investment theses. Uh, for for this next wave, but you know the the way we do things and and you know kind of the the rest of the structure is is, is very very similar, <laughs> you know, and and that's kind of the whole point. You know, we're a pure play on that style of investing. You know, what matters the specific themes evolve.、Uh, the team you know has been built, and you know certain certain things matter. You know,、uh, you know,、uh, in in terms of how we go about sourcing deals or building companies. You know, some of, some of the tactics change, but. Uh, but the broad the broad strategy is is super <laughs> super consistent.、Mm-hmm. So I'm curious, like, so what are what like since like you mentioned, like you know, vector is becoming this like a really hot sector. Like, you know, what are something that we should look for now to like when be, like this thing may become like the next、um, big wave? I think there's a whole ecosystem、uh, mm-hmm. that needs to be built out.、Uh, mm-hmm. Around vector data and、mm-hmm. and the, the workloads that make use of vector data, and and、mm-hmm. so Pinecone is a big part of that, right? That's at the、mm-hmm. at the at the foundation. <laughs> But what about ETL?、Mm-hmm. Um, so I think working with Snowflake, I observed some really big companies get built、mm-hmm. doing ETL in the Snowflake paradigm, or、mm-hmm. you know what came to be called ELT.、Uh, mm-hmm. And so I'm referring to companies like like Fivetran,、uh, like DBT Labs.、Um, And they really、uh, took advantage of all the momentum around Snowflake,、mm-hmm. and so I, I think similarly, all the momentum around vector processing, vector data,、uh, is、mm-hmm. going to create opportunities for ETL type companies、uh, mm-hmm. that are are going to、um, play really nicely, <laughs> you、mm-hmm. know, with with、uh, with with the vector data platform and and、um, and other pieces of the stack, right? And so this is sort of what I mean. That's an example of what I mean by building out this AI first tech stack. You know, I think there's like 
50 opportunities like that, you know, that, like that uh, to build significant, you know, multi-billion dollar, hopefully independent public companies. Let's say like if I'm like a non-technical person trying to learn about this space, um, how would you go about like the learning process? Like since yeah. like a typical VC can talk to like a billion companies. Yeah. To I, if I was a non-technical person, I want to invest in this space, I'd focus on the applications, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the infrastructure stuff that, uh, that I have been talking about mostly on, on this podcast I'd, is is, a, is a, a tougher hill to climb, you know, for mm -hmm. truly for a non-technical person. Um, but a lot of us can understand the applications that would, you know, make a difference uh, in our work life. Mm -hmm. uh, and so all the applications that are going to be built on top of this stack, you know, mm -hmm. that they're super attractive opportunities there too. Uh, and, and there's more of them, right? You know, so the higher up you go on the stack, I mean, there's just a greater number. Uh, a, a greater count of mm -hmm. potential opportunities. The further down you go, um, they could be really, really big outcomes, but they're probably fewer in number the further down the stack you go. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you go all the way to the bottom of the stack, what, what have you got, right? Like semiconductors, you know? So how many NVIDIAs are there gonna be? <laughs> you know, you know? NVIDIA is a hell of a company, you know, but like, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not sure I wanna compete with those guys. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe around the edges, you know, and yeah, and then so, and we have a, uh, you know, a semiconductor company that, mm -hmm. you know, is very focused on the edge that, you know, will collide with NVIDIA a little bit, but like, you know, it's, it's, gonna, there's going to be a smaller number of winners, you know, the further down the stack you go. Um, so, but up stack, I think it's really more uh, about the problem to be solved under, you know, empathy uh, for the user, the outcomes that, that they care about. Uh, and that uh, I think is, probably, probably uh, a good place to focus. And, you know, that's about half our work too. You know, I, it, uh, a lot of, a lot of wings activity is, is definitely at the application layer and this, this new generation is really exciting. I love that. So like, I'm curious, like, is there like any new company that you are like recently worked on? Like that's kind of, um, in the application layers that you can walk us through, like how you found them and then like how you kind of like decided to make the investment. I mean, like, so one example, it's not super new. I mean, I don't, I don't want to <laughs> over disclose, <laughs> but some things that are at least, you know, fairly visible right now, uh, one of our companies uh, that is clearly very AI native is Copy AI mm -hmm. and uh, Copy uses LLM technology uh, for marketing copy generation, you know, kind of um, as really kind of as a thought starter, it's not claiming to uh, produce, you know, your finished white paper, <laughs> but but as a way to get past writer's block uh, to to get mm -hmm. started, it's 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 a real enabler. And one of the things that's cool about Copy um, is they are very committed to the product led growth model. And and so when mm -hmm. you're doing application investing, you really have to think this go to market model uh, is got to be front and center because it, it shapes. It's not like an after the fact decision. It is, mm -hmm. it, it shapes the product itself. And so copy, uh, e even in architecting their product was very committed to driving bottoms up adoption. Mm -hmm. um, they, they have an enormous, you know, millions and millions and millions of users. Uh, and uh, and it just have gotten tremendous leverage out of that uh, in improving their product. And also obviously building a very efficient go to market engine. Mm -hmm. now, now, with all these application companies, and this is true of copy too, you, you really want to avoid the trap of being some kind of a thin shim on, you know, third party mm -hmm. model technology. And, and, and there's a lot of that stuff that you can you can encounter where, you know, the layer of value that's being mm -hmm. added by the application, you know, mm -hmm. on top of the rest of the stack is is not, you know, substantial enough to where you think that's going to be a lasting company. So uh, the really interesting ones um, are, yes, they're, you know, probably using industry models in, in some form, but they're doing all kinds of augmentation and adaptation around that. Uh, maybe it's working with the data itself and, and how they're leveraging, uh, you know, unique private data. Uh, maybe it has to do with um, uh, additional, uh, you know, you, you know, orchestrating multiple models, do, you know, doing some model development of their own, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in, uh, to run alongside, you know, some of the, some of the great innovations from um, uh, widely available technology. So, so kind of how much how much real depth is there is like important to ask yourself you know if you, you can't just be repackaging open ai that that's i think i think and i'm not saying anything that isn't obvious there but uh it's it's a really a core thing to focus on and in the case of copy i mean that there's tremendous richness uh in in what's been done um that in a, on a proprietary basis in addition to you know obviously some of the things that they're using uh, from the industry at large. How do you exam that? I've seen a lot of like, basically exactly what you said about like, you know, basically open AI plus the amazing front end development. 
and like there's some really simple code out there but like how do you differentiate like a copy ai versus like the rest of them from as you know especially as a non-technical person um it's kind of like hard to tell like yeah. well the, i mean the first thing you can look at is just what's the level of investment right <laughs> you know so how much how much uh, you know how much uh, sort of true software engineering is going on in this company mm -hmm. as opposed to just repackaging uh you know, the second thing is sort of what's the quality of results that are being delivered, uh, you know, with with that uh, with that system. Is it is it really any better than what, um, you, you know, you could do using just, you know, just available, uh, you know, industry technology from, you know, someone like OpenAI or, or others. Uh, and so I think, you know, measuring measuring quality results uh, is that that's kind of a big field in and of itself, you know, sort of that that and, and that frankly leads to a lot of other interesting companies that are in the the evaluation business and evaluation mm -hmm. is you know that is a big term i mean that that includes a lot of stuff <laughs> a lot of say, everything from things that look a lot like security and privacy to things that look like you know measuring mm -hmm. quality of results to things that are detecting bias i mean you know that that's a that's a big field um mm -hmm. and uh, you know obviously one that we're uh, investing in as well and are super interested in i think is going to be pretty important totally um i feel like it's especially really hard as like you know i got these deals and like i sometimes look at it um when i ask the founder basically their explanation is like we need to build a prototype before we actually invest in the like a lot of strong engineering team so it's really hard to kind of like kind of like identify them before they um you know become like something that we cannot really put money in because they're so big i definitely feel like there's a lot of like you know i'm def definitely going to look at the evaluation businesses so we have like a couple minutes left i really want to go through like some of the questions so i saw one of the questions from the audience says like what do you think is the importance of open source is in this landscape i heard like basically like close like not non-open source is like the new thing now like so not the new thing but like people are evaluating as like you know a lot better than open source like you know because i i don't like I'm definitely not an expert, not a technical expert, but Peter, you can like feel free to address anything that you feel like. Yeah, yeah, I think open source is hugely important. <clears throat> um, it's really going to drive a lot of the innovation um, in this area. It, it's, it, and this is not to say that everything should be open source though, or has to be open source. But mm -hmm. I, I think open source in in a lot of the parts of the stack is, is super important. Um, I think in the model space in particular, op open source is hugely important, and you know because this mm -hmm. is how. Uh, people are going to going to be able to adapt uh, model technology to their specific uses, and and businesses are going to want to do that. You know, the the one size fits all Uber model um, trained on the public internet. I mean, it has mm -hmm. its use, but mm -hmm. uh, it is not <laughs> not at least certainly in the B two B use cases, it's not going to be the be all end all. And I think a lot of application developers are also going to need uh, to do um, you know their their own adaptation work with you know, uh, proprietary data for, for a lot of reasons, um, you know, limit, uh, you know, you know, mm -hmm. things <laughs> that are, that are, that are fed into models so that, uh, so to keep them on course. So, so I think that, that whole part of, uh, of the value chain really benefits from open source. Um, you know, things that are like hardcore infrastructure, maybe mm -hmm. not, you know, I mean, you know, that, that's, that's less, you know, Snowflake is is not open source, and nobody's asking for it to be open source. You know, they want they want a great data platform that solves their problems, and that you know they're innovating on top of that. Uh, so, you know, mm -hmm. so they want, you know, there are things that they want, but it, you know, open sourceness isn't isn't necessarily the key. So, you know, similarly for some of the applications, you know, I mean, is application layer is open source important there? Well, you know, may, maybe less so, but a lot of the things that um, a lot of the some of the dev tooling, um, you know, uh, you know, there there are you know strong strong reasons for open source there and obviously what i said about the models from a non-technical -te perspective like when i think about like you know the differentiation sometimes like maybe because of like the different data sets um that you can get like the exclusivity of the data set in in a way like maybe you kind of deep deeper into a specific domain because of they have different data so like you can kind of like generate different things out of the different data so i'm definitely not an expert there um it's definitely something interesting to look into um so there's a couple other questions uh one of the questions is is there ai company that we should keep an eye on that have gone public or going public well i mean no uh, 
<laughs> the, uh, yeah, the, I mean, I think there's uh, certainly public companies or, or very late stage private companies, they're <clears throat> incorporating um, AI into their, you know, into their product lines. Um, and, and they should do that, right? And so application companies are, are building AI native capabilities into their applications. Uh, and, um, you know, in, infrastructure companies are adding abilities, uh, you know, to sort of support AI workloads. Um, but, you know, th these are, you know, kind of afterthoughts <laughs> in most cases, right? And I, I think the, and it, that's important to do, and I would do that too, uh, if I was them, right? Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, it's, there will be cases where you really got to go clean sheet of paper. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I, I, I had a, a great conversation with the founder the other day where, you know, he was laughing and said, um, yeah, you know, any, anything you did prior to November 22 is, is worthless. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like throw that away. And I, I don't think that's, I don't like totally agree with that, but you know, there, he's got a point, right? You know, there's kind mm -hmm. of, there, there's been a big reorientation around the thrust uh, of, of the industry and developers in particular uh, mm -hmm. over the past nine months. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, building the right product to support that movement, that's, that's, that's mm -hmm. the new, new thing, right? The, the bolt on um, probably won't get you there. Okay. So another question from the audience is, uh, basically at what point would you decide to cut away from an investment and what are signals and factors that's important, uh, when you make that decision? Yeah. Um, Oh, that's such a hard decision. <laughs> and it's, I mean, a lot of times, frankly, you're led by the team uh, mm -hmm. and, and you got to pay close attention to what the team is observing. And, you know, when the team, when, you know, because the team is usually, at, at least if you've backed the right founders, they're, they're the most committed people in the world. And, and if they are saying, hey, it's time to sell, you mm -hmm. really got to pay close attention to that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there, I, there have been cases where, you know, we certainly tried to mm -hmm. Help help teams see the bigger opportunity and not get lured by an early easy acquisition, which maybe is a lot of money in the short term, but they're, you know, giving up on their giving up on a dream that has a lot of viability in it, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, but you know those are that's one set of cases that's not really cutting away, you know. But but when it's really just sort of calling a spade a spade, uh, I mean a lot of that has to do, you know you're just looking at product market fit. You know a lot of it comes down to product market fit and you're trying to assess uh, if you have it or you don't, or can you get to it? And if you've missed on product market fit, if there isn't anything fairly practical that can be done to get to it, then, you, you know, th those are the moments where you've got to, you know, um, you know sort of admit, <laughs> admit reality. <laughs> and, and at that point, it's not sort of not quote cutting away. I mean, what we will do is we'll continue to work with the teams to try and, um, land the plane gracefully, you know, in, in mm -hmm. some, you know, some form, some form, uh, the best possible acquisition outcome that, you know, can be delivered. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, that, uh, again, that, you know, we're, in our role, we're lead investors. So, you know, we're, we're, we're not, um, you know, just sort of friendly angels, you know, hanging around that can go spend our time elsewhere. You know, we, you know, we made a commitment to these founders and, and these teams and we're going to see it through. Totally. Okay. So we have, um, sorry, Peter, I don't know how many times you have, but I'm going to keep it within like two minutes. Okay. One of the questions was texted by, um, a friend. So, uh, they're asking why compared to the crypto crash last year, like, you know, crypto or like blockchain was the biggest thing than this year's AI. Like how do you identify like, you know, AI would be a lasting sector to invest in basically. I think you just look at the value that's being created. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, and sort of the, these are real use cases for customers <laughs> with mm -hmm. money uh, and, the, and they're getting very positive ROI uh, mm -hmm. on, on the investments that are being made. Um, so, you know, that's kind of where it all where it all starts and stops. Um, you know, with crypto, I mean, like, look, I'm interested in blockchain. You know, I think decentralized systems are important, but mm -hmm. there was clearly speculation being driven in stuff that wasn't really adding value in, 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 it, it was sort of, uh, it was sort of a happening <laughs> and, uh, and, and that was not, you know, but where was, where was the, the actual economic value being created at the end of the day, like that, that has to be there or, you know, the, the enthusiasm is, is, is going to melt away. Oh my God. As a person wearing like an NFT LA t-shirt, I definitely feel like 
Um, <laughs> I don't really know how I feel about all these different trends. But anyway, so we have like one minute fire round for you. So Peter, what's your favorite book? Oh, what's my favorite book? Absalom, Absalom by William Faulkner. Who made the biggest impact in your career? Biggest impact on my career? I'd say the two founders of Excel,、um, Arthur Patterson and Jim Swartz. Who would you invite to your dinner party? <laughs> Jesus. Okay, so the last one is like, where can we find you outside of work? On the water, you know. I, I, I am a very avid sailboat racer. Oh, you're a sailboat racer? Racer? Okay, where do you race?、Um, all over. You know, I was in last race I did was in Chicago. You know, next one will be here in San Francisco. Got something going on in Rhode Island in the fall. Yeah. Oh wow! You you just said that casually. So first of all, like I have to acquire the capital to buy a sailboat. But anyway, so there's Sail, that. Great sailboats are cheap, man. <laughs> they they last they last forever. You you don't have to. I mean, some some can be very expensive, but you can get a sailboat. You can find people who give you one for free <laughs> just to get it out of their yard. I I just need to ask when you can give me that boat for free. But anyway,、okay. so. Okay, great. So, thank you so much, Peter, for coming on the show today. It was really a pleasure. Thanks for having me, Grace. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna end the broadcast. Thanks for tuning into Smart Venture Podcast. If you learned something from the episode, or even just mildly tolerated me, please subscribe and leave a five star rating. I promise I will keep bringing you more successful, insightful interviews and insider tips about startups. Remember, sharing is caring. So tell your friends to listen too, or enemies. I won't judge. Until next time, keep venturing smartly.